This is RCT number two, intro part B. We are looking at the history and the authority of the Catechism of Trent. Hello, my name is Father David Nix. This is the Padre Peregrino podcast. This is the new series, Roman Catechism of Trent. If you listen to RCT one, we explain why this is the infallible catechism of the Catholic Church. And then today in RCT two, this is the introduction part B, as I said, now we are going to look at the what and the who and the why of the catechism of the 16th century that now still holds pride of place as the highest catechism ever produced by the Catholic Church. Let's begin in prayer. In nomine patri sefiri et spiritu santi, amen. Heavenly King, Consoler Spirit, Spirit of Truth, who art present everywhere and filling all things, treasure of all good and source of all life, come dwell in us, cleanse us and save us, you who are all good, amen. In nomine patri sefiri et spiritu santi, amen. Quick note also, you will hear me quote page numbers and the RCT version that I will be using on this and all future podcasts and videos is the Tan Books hardback of the Roman Catechism of Trent, also known as the Catechism of the Council of Trent, showing it if you're on the video version, you can see it on your screen right now. Again, that is the Tan Books that I will be using for the next few years here, but I think any translation will do. Now remember from the last time, Pope Clement VIII said that the Roman Catechism contains that teaching which is the common doctrine of the Church from which all danger of doctrinal error is absent. I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of that Catechism, but before we do that, I realized in RCT1 I trailed off in something I wanted to go a little bit deeper into, and that is why we are doing the RCT, the Roman Catechism of Trent, and not what is commonly referred to as the Catechism. We see that abbreviated as CCC. That was the one that was produced by Pope John Paul II in 1992. So CCC is frequently called today the Catechism. It's not a bad catechism. I probably should have said that a little clearer last time. As for the Catechism of the Catholic Church, CCC, the one that came out in 1992, you can learn lots of good things from it. Most of it is good traditional teaching. But there's a few small errors in that, which makes it not infallible. And one of those is the death penalty. As I said in the last podcast, or meant to say, the death penalty is not even top 50 dogmatic issues we're going to look at in this series. So you probably wonder why I bring it up again in RC2, RCT2 if it's not even that important. Well, it's because the new catechism has flip-flopped numerous times on the death penalty, both in the 90s and then also in the past five years, whereas the Catholic Church has always, always, always held the death penalty as a necessary part to justice and a functioning civilization. So that, that right there tells you both the RCT and the CCC cannot both be infallible. God doesn't change his mind. My first podcast, RCT1, that named the infallible sources of the Catholic Church. So let's look briefly at a few of those on the death penalty. The New Testament infallibly and inerrantly promotes the death penalty in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 14. Since the Holy Spirit himself says through the Apostle Paul, quote, Let every soul be subject to higher powers, for there is no power but from God. And those that are ordained of God. Therefore he that resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist purchase to themselves damnation. For princes are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to thee for good. For if thou do that which is evil, fear. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doth, doth evil. End quote. Now that was the Dewey Rhymes Bible. Probably gives you somewhat of an idea why I use the ESV in my VLX series because... Most of you have no idea what I just said. So let's see what the church fathers, how did the church fathers interpret Romans 13 to be God's infallible word telling us to keep the death penalty? St. Augustine writes, quote, The agent who executes the killing does not commit homicide. He is an instrument as is the sword with which he cuts. Therefore, it is in no way contrary to the commandment thou shalt not kill to wage war at God's bidding or for the representatives of public authority to put criminals to death according to the law that is the will of the most just reason, end quote. So notice he's not, that's in uh, City of God, 
Book 1, Chapter 21. So notice St. Augustine isn't giving the green light to communist governments and Nazi governments to kill people because he just said that has to be the will of the most just reason. However, assuming that a government is using reason and actually targeting real criminals, not people who are just guilty of thought crimes as we're seeing crop up in our country right now, we hear St. Augustine say again that putting to death a criminal is not against the commandment thou shall not kill because this is ascribed to the representatives of public authority to put criminals to death. Notice also that all the popes before 1950, they all promote the death penalty. Pope Innocent I writes, quote, It must be remembered that power was granted by God to the magistrates and to avenge crime by the sword was permitted. He who carries out this vengeance is God's minister. Again, he's quoting Romans 13 there. Why should we condemn, he continues, Pope Innocent I, why should we condemn a practice that all hold to be permitted by God? We uphold, therefore, what has been observed until now in order not to alter the discipline and so that we may not appear to act contrary to God's authority, end quote. St. Thomas Aquinas, he also defends the death penalty by quoting Exodus and the Psalms, quote, Wizards thou shalt not suffer to live, Exodus twenty two eighteen and in the morning I put to death all the wicked of the land. That's Psalm 100, verse 8. St. Thomas continues, Every part is directed to the whole as imperfect to perfect. Wherefore, every part exists naturally for the sake of the whole. For this reason, we see that if the health of the whole human body demands the excision of a member because it became putrid or infectious to the other members, it would be both praiseworthy and healthful to have it cut away. Now every individual person is related to the entire society, as a part to the whole. Therefore, if a man be dangerous and infectious to the community on account of some sin, it is praiseworthy and healthful that he be killed in order to safeguard the common good, since a little leaven corrupteth the whole lump. End quote. That is St. Thomas, Summa Theologiae, second part of the second part, question 64, article 2. And then the RCT itself, as, we'll, as we will hear in a much later podcast, reads, Quote, the power of life and death is permitted to certain civil magistrates because theirs is the responsibility under law to punish the guilty and protect the innocent. Far from being guilty by breaking this commandment, thou shalt not, thou shalt not kill, such an execution of justice is precisely an act of obedience to it. For the purpose of the law is to protect and foster human life. This purpose is fulfilled when the legitimate authority of the state is exercised by taking the guilty lives of those who have taken innocent lives. End quote. That's the Roman Catechism of the Council of Trent, Part 3, Section 5, Number 4. Again, we're going to tackle that a lot later, but notice that the death penalty is being promoted by the catechism that we're going to study for the purpose of law to protect and foster human life. And why or how is this done? It says, This responsibility belongs to those to punish the guilty and protect the innocent. So again, this can't be applied to a communist regime, uh, an unjust or in disordered regime like the Nazis. This has to be uh, to punish the guilty and protect the innocent. And that does presuppose there's an objective reality in a political and sociological situation, which again, we can prove with reason in our current situation in the church. So that's probably a lot right there for you to learn that the church is pro-death penalty, when we all grew up hearing it's anti-death penalty. And I'm sorry if you learned the Catholic Church was against the death penalty. It's not. I learned the wrong things growing up too. Um, so the Catholic Church being against the death penalty is just a modern myth that has infected most Catholics' minds, including those living in the Vatican. This is why I always say that the third secret of Fatima was the apostasy of the Church from the top down because that's the only way we could ever see that the Catholic Church has putatively changed her teachings Again, an impossibility. Okay, but this catechism came from the Council of Trent. So as promised, let's now see why the Council of Trent was called in the 16th century. A couple hundred years after that, Cardinal Newman wrote, no doctrine is defined until it's violated. Let that sentence percolate in your brain a little while. No doctrine is defined until it's violated. So let's rewind all the way, all the way back to like the Apostles St. John, St. Peter, St. Paul. Did those three saints know of the Trinity? Yes. Did they have in their vocabulary hypostatic union? Probably not. Did they have words like circumcision to describe the Trinity? Probably not, but they certainly believed in the Trinity. So why did we get later terms on the Trinity and the incarnation of Christ like circumcision and hypostatic union? Was it because things were being invented? 
No, it's because the seminal apostolic primordial version of Christianity, apostolic Catholicism, as I always call it, got attacked, usually from within. And then these doctrines had to be further elaborated, not because doctrine can change, but because attacks makes us hash out the clarity of what was once and always delivered to the apostles. So, for example, the Council of Chalcedon explains that the divinity and the humanity of Christ exist one with the other without blending and change, but also without division or separation. Now, is this something that St. Paul had to get into a lot? Probably not. Could he have via the gift of counsel that comes from the Holy Ghost? Certainly he could have defended that if God had given him the opportunity to defend that against, say, an early heretic in the church. But these Christological errors usually came a little bit later, like 3rd, 4th, 5th century. So this is why uh, numerous of these early ecumenical councils, in fact, almost all of them, had to tackle errors on the person of Christ, on the incarnation. Some of the heretics said Christ was divine but not human. The others said he was human but not divine. But the point is this. Again, as Cardinal Newman said, no doctrine is defined until it's violated. Well, what cropped up in the 16th century? Protestantism. Now, of course, unfortunately, this bled eight or nine million Catholics in Europe to go over to the dark side, to Luther's side, to King Henry's side. It is very interesting in the 16th century, it was almost that exact same number due to Our Lady of Guadalupe appearing in Mexico that brought the New World eight or nine or ten million people in. So it almost seems that God has this quota to fill of who he's going to bring to heaven. Pretty amazing that when Europe rejects the faith, eight or nine or ten million Aztecs and other nations in Mexico come into the faith, not to mention North America and South America and all the places that the Jesuits and Franciscans and Dominicans went in the 16th century. But anyway, point is Protestantism was the impetus because of all the errors that came from it and because it was such a tricky error because it claimed to come from the Bible, Protestantism became the impetus to call the Council of Trent. Again, no doctrines defined until it's violated. Now, most of you know the story of Luther. He was a crazy monk ignored way too long by the Pope they let that get way out of hand. I'll be the first to admit that they, uh, the Pope should have clamped down a lot earlier. And by the way, if there's any Protestants listening, go do your research to see Luther blasphemed Christ uh, on things too horrible to say on this podcast. I will just say, if you Google the word adultery, uh, you can find that associated with Luther and the divine person I just mentioned. Pretty horrible stuff. So, don't go thinking Luther was this great reformer who pointed out to the church that the church didn't need to be selling indulgences. Yes, it is true the church should have been selling indulgences, but that doesn't justify Luther saying horribly blasphemous things, not just about the Pope, but about Christ himself. So I'll just say he didn't blush to use that word adultery against the Son of God. Okay, so things got out of hand, and in some sense, Trent was called too late, but better later than never. And thanks to the errors of Protestantism, the church got to, get that, the Catholic Church got to define her teaching in one of the most clear ways in history. That's why the catechism that came out of Trent, the one for this series right here, is such a gem. One can only hope that when the great Pope in the future condemns all these great errors of modernism that are just mushrooming right now, We do know from the great mystics and the saints of the church that after a great period of darkness and error, which I happen to think is modernism, but I can't prove that, many of the ancient saints and mystics say that we will have this great pope who will call the great council at the time of the great monarch, and the great council will hammer out more doctrines and squash more errors than ever before. So we're going to look at the history of catechisms just a little bit right now that led up to Trent, and then just mention briefly why it is so excellent and the great authority that it holds. I'm going to read you a couple things from this catechism and the preamble, the introduction to it, to, that gives you the history. Before I, before I do that, though, I have to show you that the new myth that Protestants hold against the Catholic Church is that all you need is the Bible and emotional worship and a confessional faith to be saved. Bible, emotional worship, and confessional faith. Now, 500 years ago, What was the myth that Protestants held against Catholics? The same thing, that all you need is the Bible and emotional worship and a confessional faith to be saved. But there's a few other myths that have sort of got lost in history that they also held against Catholics. And one of these, get this, this is pretty amazing. 
was that Luther was the first to start catechizing Europe. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. You don't really hear Protestants now say, oh, we're the one with the great catechisms and the Catholic Church has no catechisms. But this was, this was actually the rumor that was spread about 500 years ago. In fact, this is the very first sentence in the introduction for this Tan Books version. It says, It has been commonly asserted by non-Catholic writers that prior to the religious rebellion of the 16th century, catechisms and catechetical instruction, in fact, all religious education of the people, had long been neglected, and that to Luther and the Reformers was due the revival of the practice of the ancient church. So notice that the early Protestants admitted the early church had catechisms. In fact, that blows out of the water a lot of the, the myths of the liberal Catholics today. Even non, non-traditional neocons tend to think that the early church was all just hands in the air and tongues and no catechisms. But what we're going to see here is that there were catechisms in the very earliest centuries of Christianity. Tan Book introduction continues that the requirements for admission into the primitive church were exacting and thorough and that catechetics or simple instructions in the fundamental teachings of Christianity were diligently imparted in those early times are facts too well known and universally admitted to require any special proof here. In other words, what this is saying is to enter the early church, you didn't just have to prove how joyful you were or something like that. The test was the catechism. Early catechisms was the test to see if you were, if you were ready to be an early Christian in the catacombs. And these were, of course, all Catholic catechisms. One of these that it mentions, and notice this comes from the East. This is from the modern era or modern geographical era that we now call Turkey. One of these came from St. Gregory of Nyssa called the Catechetical Oration. And then in the West, which would be Africa and, and Italy, we have St. Augustine's De Catechizandis Rudibus. So there we have an Eastern Catechism from St. Gregory of Nyssa and a Western Catechism from St. Augustine. Also, the book continues, at Jerusalem, indeed, in the first centuries, we know that not one but many sermons were preached after the reading of the gospel at Mass. So again, this proves the early church wasn't all about just emotion. Was there great affection for our Lord? Yes. Is there speaking in tongues? Yes, we have that in Acts. Um, Of course, there was great joy and great power and great miracles happening in the early church. I'm not doubting that. But we can't divide this from catechesis. Catechesis was refulgent in the early church. The book continues, in Milan, St. Ambrose's eloquence was renowned. At Hippo, St. Augustine delivered short colloquial instructions. St. John Chrysostom became the most famous preacher of all time. It is readily admitted that religious instruction of the people was not commonly neglected through the patristic period. Then we move on to some of the catechisms of the Middle Ages. Tan Book says, already in 529, the Council of Vaison had obliged the priests of Gaul to take boys into their household and to teach them to read the Psalms and the Holy Scriptures, and to instruct them in the law of God. From the ninth century on, there have come down to us numerous works of popular instruction composed in Latin and in the newly formed European tongues. Such, for example, were the Disputatio Perorum per Interrogationis et Responsionis, that's the ninth century, among the many catechisms and works of popular instruction which appeared between 1400 and the date of Luther's birth in 1483, maybe mentioned, Gerson's ABC of Simple Folk, and The Ordinary of Christians, and The Art of Dying by Matthew of Krakow, as well as The Treasure of Mankind, all in French. How about the Catechism of the Council of Trent? The introduction continues, But good as were these individual and separate works, the Church of the Council of Trent, assembled December 13, 1545, seeing the need of a uniform and comprehensive manual which would supply parish priests with an official book of instruction for the faithful, ordered the preparation of the work, which has ever since been variously known as the Catechism of the Council of Trent or the Catechism of Pius V. It was some months, however, after the opening of the council before mention was made of any kind of catechism. So again, this catechism I'm holding is the fruit of the Council of Trent in the 16th century, which was convened in 1545. 13th of December, 1545. Then we learn a little bit more about the catechism. A final decree regarding such a catechism was passed in a general meeting on November 2nd of the same year, wherein it was enjoined on all bishops to see that the catechism should be faithfully translated into the vulgar tongue. Vulgar just means English, Spanish, French, whatever you and I are speaking, and expounded the people by all parish priests. The manuscript was therefore carried to Rome, and the work was continued with little, de- with little delay. 
Meanwhile, Cardinal Serpandi died, and St. Charles Borromeo was appointed to succeed him as president of the Catechism Committee. So notice this book came from a doctor and saint of the church especially, that is, St. Robert Borromeo. How about the English translations? We learn in English the earliest known translation of the Catechism was made in 1675, but embraces only parts number one and four. It is a very rare work, being found neither in the British Museum nor in the Bodleian. The only extant copy of it that we know of is in possession of the English Dominican Fathers in London. And then we learn a little bit later that it was the Irish, of course, who got the translations down the right way. Now let's just talk briefly about the authority and excellence of this catechism. Intro, page 40, says, In his bull of the 14th of June, 1761, Clement XIII said that the catechism contains a clear explanation of of all that is necessary for salvation. Let me read that again. Clement VIII said this catechism contains a clear explanation of all that is necessary for salvation and useful for the faithful, that it was composed with great care and industry and has been highly praised by all, that by it in former times the faith was strengthened and that no other catechism can be compared with it. He concluded then that the Roman pontiffs offered this work to pastors as a norm of Catholic teaching and discipline so that there might be uniformity and harmony in the, in the instruction of all. Pope Leo XIII, a little bit later, in an encyclical on 8th of September, 1899, to the bishops and clergy of France, recommended two books read to be read and studied constantly, namely the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas and what he called that golden book, namely the Catechismus ad Parocos, that is, the Catechism for Priests, which is this. Regarding the latter work, he wrote, This work is remarkable at once for the richness and exactness of its doctrine and for the elegance of its style. It is a precious summary of all theology, both dogmatic and moral. He who understands it well will have always at his service those aids by which a priest is enabled to preach with fruit, to acquit himself worthily of the important ministry of the confessional and of the direction of souls, and will be in a position to refute the objections of unbelievers. Likewise, Pius X in his encyclical Acerbo Nimis of the 15th of April 1905 declared that adults, no less than children, need religious instruction, especially in these days. And hence, he prescribed that pastors and all who have care of souls should give catechetical instruction to the faithful in simple language and in a way suited to the capacity of their hearers. And for that purpose, they should use the Catechism of the Council of Trent and by the way, I think I mentioned this on the last one. Some of you might feel that you got stiffed in doing the whole CPX series, but as I said, we can consider that infallible because probably 99 to 100% of that Pope St. Pius X took from this book. It's just the shorter version. Then we learn a little bit later in the Tan Books intro, in five different countries convened at Milan, St. Charles Borromeo, this is rewinding 500 years ago, St. Charles Borromeo ordered that the catechism should be studied in seminaries, discussed in the conferences of the clergy, and explained by pastors to their people on occasion of their administration of the sacraments. Conferences of the clergy. Can you imagine a presbyteral council or a all-priest gathering sitting down and studying the Catechism of the Council of Trent? That's what a saint and doctor of the church wants, though. Then we hear in that after the sacred scriptures, there is no work that can be read with greater safety and profit. After the sacred scriptures, there is no work that can be read with greater safety and profit than the Roman Catechism of Trent. And then uh, just two more paragraphs for you. It says, in particular, the, in particular, Cardinal Valerius, the friend of St. Charles Borromeo, wrote of this catechism. This work contains all that is needful for the instruction of the faithful, and it is written with such order, clearness, and majesty that through it we seem to hear Holy Mother, the Church herself, taught by the Holy Ghost, speaking to us. It was composed by order of the Fathers, fathers of Trent under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and was published by the authority of the Vicar of Christ. Did you hear that? This comes from the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Not my words, this is the friend of St. Charles Borromeo. And then we have this, Salma Ticenses, the great Carmelite commentators on St. Thomas, paid the following high tribute to the catechism, quote, the authority of this catechism has always been of the greatest in the church because it was composed by the command of the Council of Trent, because its authors were men of highest learning, and because it was approved only after the severe scrutiny by Popes Pius V and Gregory XIII, and has been recommended in nearly all the councils that have been held since the Council of Trent. 
By the way, there's just one missing that didn't promote this. I'm sure you can guess what council that was. Clue, it was not a dogmatic council. Antonio Posavino, an illustrious Jesuit, old school good Jesuit, and the preceptor of St. Francis de Sales said, quote, the catechism of the Council of Trent was inspired by the Holy Ghost. Oops, found two more paragraphs in the introduction to share with you. In its exposition of the creed and the sacraments while dealing with the profoundest mysteries, it is full of thoughts and reflections, the most fervent and inspiring. The part on the Decalogue, which is just the Ten Commandments, which might well be called a treatise on ascetical theology, teaches us in words burning with zeal, both what we are to avoid and what we are to do to keep the commandments of God. In the fourth and last part of this beautiful work, we have what is doubtless the most sublime and heavenly exposition of the doctrine of prayer ever written. The Roman Catechism is therefore a handbook of dogmatic and moral theology, a confessor's guide, a book of exposition for the preacher, and a choice directory of the spiritual life for pastor and flock alike, alike with a view, consequently, to make it more readily available for these high purposes among English-speaking people, this new translation has been prepared and is herewith respectfully submitted to its readers. And this comes from two Dominicans, John McHugh and Charles Callan. I assume they were both priests about 100 years ago. So next time we will start with Part 1, The Creed of the Roman Catechism of Trent, page 11, if you have this Tan Books version. And just two things really quick to finish up with. First, a traditional blogger and podcaster implied that I stayed silent regarding an important celebrity in exchange for money. She lied about that, and she will answer to God for lying about a priest. For we podcasters all answer to God, not only for denotation, but also to connotation. I promise you that I've never asked such a celebrity for money and that he's never given me money. I'm a little fish, and my un income comes from little fish like you. When a big fish chooses to be friends with a little fish like me, it's because I don't ask them for advance in my life. Most of you know by now I would be just as unafraid to stand up to him as I am standing up to her, especially when either soul is in danger of perishing. And finally, you can catch all of these videos on Rumble or BitChute in case I'm ever deplatformed on YT. Please say an Our Father for me at Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris Fidi et Spiritus Santi, descendet super vos et maniat semper. Amen. <laughs>